think it was Epictetus said this, right? The place that we have power, the only place we have power is with our choices and with our conceptions. I think it's Epictetus. Do you know? They all basically said that. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, it's a pretty stoic thing. The only place you have power is your choices and your conceptions. When we look at these things that drive us, there is usually an infinite number of ways we could relate to them differently from the outside in to those concepts and also get into those concepts and unpack what they mean and shift them. And when we do this, when people do this, when you start to really work with the details of your worldview, the underpinnings of your everyday trances, you know, the, the matrix of your own life, whatever, when you learn to do that, you can radically recreate your consciousness structures, your being, all of this kind of stuff. And that changes how you show up and engage with the world. It changes. It, you're, you're, this is stoic strength, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, I don't know if it was Seneca, I think it was Epictetus said this, right? I think. But the place that we have power, the only place we have power is with our choices and with our conceptions, right? I think it's Epictetus. Do you know? They all basically said that. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, it's a pretty stoic thing. The only place yes. you have power is your choices and your conceptions. Yeah. Now, people could skip over that quite quickly and go, oh, yeah, okay. Maybe they hear the choices because that's a kind of obvious thing. Most people get the concept of choice. They go, oh, yep, this or this, right? I have the power to choose. But that other bit with their conceptions, this is a much more slippery proposition. And what that really means, your conceptions, is the sense that you make of something, how you render it up within yourself. So we don't live in the world as it is. We're constantly rendering it up in our minds through our conceptions or how we conceptualize things. But what most people do is they take the concepts they're using and they never question them. They just think they're features of the world. It's like conformity somebody will think that's a feature of the world conformity isn't a thing you can't weigh it you can't measure it it's an abstract concept applied to the world but it might shape somebody's experience of it so the stuff that in in my work that i do the developmental coaching work that i do the place that i'm really getting into is helping people come to see how they're conceptually rendering things and to transform that rendering so i'm working really with the level of conceptions and choice as well because if you don't, the two go together. Ironically, they kind of, they, they eat each other or they feed each other. I don't know which way it is. Mm -hmm. Because your conceptions shape the choices that you see. But if you don't step into choice in its sort of, I don't know, archetypal form, then you can't work with your conceptions. So there's a, there's a sort of weird circularity between conceptions and choices, which can make it challenging for people to kind of bootstrap themselves out of their little patterns of being in the world. Um, so this is where I help people because as an outside agent, I can help people see what they've been seeing through, which is helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it can be tricky to do your, yourself, particularly if you haven't yet learned to outframe your own conceptual sets and things like that. That's a tricky thing. Most people don't even know. I'm, as I'm talking about that, I'm sure a lot of people watching this will be thinking, James, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> you know, I'm, I am using technical terms for doing specific kinds of self-development work, so please forgive me, audience, for doing that. Well, it makes me think... Of, of the of the concept of blind spots and how can you mm. be aware of something that you are unaware of and i remember i read an article a couple of years ago where it was how how to actually it it, it actually got me thinking how can you discover a blind spot and the article was talking about how you can't see the wind, but you can see the effect of the wind on the wheat as it as it mm. waves down, as pushed down, and and it's affected. And so, to my thinking, kind of to, to what your last point was there is to to discover these 
things that are hidden, these mental models, perhaps we could look at, well, what's happening? And then try to imagine, what would I have to believe that this seems true for me, or this seems false, or this is bad, or this is good? Is that kind of the skill set that you're talking about? Absolutely. And I, I actually have a name for this. I call it speculative semantic modeling. And um, what I mean by that is it's building a model of how somebody must think about something or might think about something that would explain their behavior or their way of engaging. Mm -hmm. Now, I do this with myself as much as other people because, you know, we're strangers to ourselves. It's really hard. Like there's a clip that I put on the front of one of my YouTube videos from Jordan Peterson, who is a controversial character amongst some, um, but I found, you know, he's got some useful bits and pieces for me. So there's a line where in typical Peterson-esque fashion, he's saying, if you want to know what somebody believes, don't ask them, what the bloody hell do they know, right? <laughs> and, and I just love that, you know, what the bloody hell do people know about what they believe? Because the real beliefs that we hold, we, we, are, we don't know that they're beliefs. They're just taken as read. They're taken as facts, mm -hmm. You know, I don't think, well, you know, I believe there's a coffee table in front of me. I don't treat that as a belief. That's in a different category. It's called, it's got a fact for me. And I'm not even consciously thinking about it. I'm just responding to the unconsciously held fact that there's a coffee table there. Right. So oftentimes, when I look at other people's behaviors, coming from an NLP background, modeling is a big thing. The idea is basically that all human behavior is just patterns. And their patterns run in approximately the same wet wear. So if you're already great at doing something, if I can crack that pattern, if I can model that pattern out of you well enough and take it on myself, I can do a fair approximation of whatever you can do. So you can model anything. You can model skills. You can model attitudes. You can model strategies. You can model tactics. You can model at all sorts of different levels. So this idea of modeling, this was a huge game changer for me when I learned this. Um, one of the things that I tend to do, and I call this speculative semantic modeling, number one, because I'm speculating. So you say about you see the wind, you can't see the wind, but you see the effects of the wind. Mm -hmm. So you infer the nature of the wind from its effects. There's a speculation there about the nature of the wind based upon your observations. So I'm doing speculative semantic modeling. It's semantic because it's to do with meaning making, the meanings we're making underneath the surface. So if you do something excellently, you have a way of showing up and engaging in a particular context in life. I want to know what meanings you're making. I want to know what the, the whole ecology of meaning making you're doing around that thing is. Because if I saw things the way you do and made sense of them the way you do, the same sorts of uh, sensibilities, choices, behaviors would likely emerge. I mean, there may be some different skill sets if we're modeling something like, I don't know, pool playing. There's actual skill and coordination stuff involved with that. Yeah. Um, but in other areas of life, there's less skill acquisition required. Um, so I do that all the time, and I do that with myself because I'm mostly curious about, well, what am I believing in this moment that's having me behave and respond this way? What is the sense that I'm making that I've never questioned that always runs outside of consciousness? And that's your point about blind spots. Because the biggest blind spot that we experience is to what we truly believe. It's very difficult to see what you're seeing the world through. So that creates a blind spot. And this is the point, again, going back to the, the stoic idea of where you have powers with your conceptions and your choices those conceptions they shape everything that we see but they're invisible to us by default they're invisible to us we can render them more visible and that is often by looking at how looking at the the consequences of them and backward mapping i call that sherlock holmes coaching when i do that with people because it's like being sherlock holmes on the following that line of clues back to what must this what must the sense making be that's, that sits underneath of this 
Yeah. Mm-hmm.